Hello, everybody. Welcome. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're calling from in the world. Thank you very much for joining this agent webinar hosted by IUCN and USAID. My name is Kate Oren. I'm Senior Gender Program Manager with IUCN Global Program on Governance and Rights Gender Team. And it is my pleasure to introduce our session and the presenters. On behalf of IUCN, allow me to begin by thanking each of you for your interest in this topic and for spending this time with us today. And a very special thank you to USAID as this webinar, as well as the joint work we're presenting has been made possible with their support. Specifically, I wanna thank our partnership with the Office of Gender Equality and Women's Empowerment, GenDev, and the Office of Forestry and Biodiversity, FAB. Now, before I continue, very briefly, a couple of virtual housekeeping matters. Participants will all be kept in mute mode during the webinar to minimize disruptions, background noise, and any connectivity issues. I'd like to draw your attention though to the control panel, most likely on the right-hand side of your screen. Here you will find boxes for technical support and for sending questions to the panelists throughout the presentations. My colleague, Jamie Wen will be supporting the technical aspects of this web webinar, so please do not hesitate to reach out to her using the chat function if you have any technical difficulties. Again, her name is Jamie Wen. Now, we also use the chat function for your questions and we're, we welcome you to type them in at any time. Please feel very welcome to send in your questions throughout the presentations and simply specify the name of the panelist to whom you are addressing your question. Jamie and I will be collecting these questions and indeed try to get to as many of them as we can after the three presentations. Handouts are also available to support the webinar, again, on the right-hand side of your screen in the control panel. And finally, this webinar is being recorded and both the video and the presentations will be made online on our agentgenderandenvironment.org resource hub. And these will also be emailed to you in the following days. So our agenda for today, we are presenting some of the research, key findings, promising practices, and other aspects of gender and fisheries sea of opportunities, a recently launched knowledge product from IUCN and USAID. Jackie Silas, my colleague in the gender team at IUCN, will speak to the development of this work and the varied roles of women in fisheries. Dr. Heidi Schutenberg from USAID's Office of Forestry and Biodiversity. We'll then dive into the linkages between gender equality and sustainable fisheries management. And then Corinne Hart of USAID's Office of Gender Equality and Women's Empowerment will discuss some further key issues, including gender-based violence in fisheries and taking strategic action. We'll certainly leave time for questions and answers. And then if time allows, I will ask each of our speakers to leave us with one key takeaway. So speakers do keep that in the back of your minds as the discussion unfolds. A brief introduction to the initiative under which we have been working, AGENT, Advancing Gender in the Environment, is a 10-year partnership between IUCN and USAID focused uniquely at the intersection of gender and environment issues. AGENT works twofold, to increase the effectiveness of environmental programming through robust gender integration and to improve gender equality and women's empowerment outcomes across a broad range of environmental sectors, recognizing that environmental programming presents powerful opportunities for gender responsive action and results. Agents Fisheries work supports the wild caught fisheries sector in particular to be gender responsive by filling knowledge gaps, sharing best practices, and encouraging the documentation of experiences. So our objectives today in this webinar, complementing the objectives of our collaboration overall, are to first introduce some of the main gender related issues in the wild caught fisheries sector, including gender based violence. We've aimed to better understand how enhancing women's roles can promote effective and sustainable fisheries management while supporting women's economic empowerment and gender equality. And speakers will explore strategic interventions that can enhance sustainable fisheries management, gender equality, and women's empowerment outcomes, including how USAID is integrating gender into its fisheries programming. We'll explore this through a brief case study example and current ongoing research. Now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce my colleague and our first speaker today. Jackie Siles is a Senior Gender Program Manager for IUCN Global Program on Governance and Rights Gender Team. An agricultural engineer by training, 
She provides technical assistance on gender mainstreaming and women's rights into initiatives related to agriculture, energy, fisheries, red, forest landscape restoration, and climate change adaptation and mitigation across Latin America, as well as currently in countries such as Uganda, Ghana, Malawi, Mozambique, Burundi, Ghana, and Cameroon. She supports regional organizations, local and national governments, including ministries of environment, energy, and agriculture, women's and indigenous organizations in areas such as watershed management, community participation, organic agriculture, and gender and social inclusion. An expert trainer, Jackie has authored several publications on gender and environment themes. She has more than 15 years of experience, especially in the Mesoamerican region, on environmental and agricultural projects that promote sustainable and equitable human development, as well as social and gender inclusion in public policy with organizations such as CARE, Wetlands International, and CATIE, the Tropical Agricultural Research and Higher Education Center. Jackie, the floor is yours. Thanks, Kate, for the introduction. I would like to initiate my presentation by saying that through the agent partnership, IUCN and USAID have developed the Gender and Future Sieve of Opportunities, a guidance document which outlines existing evidence and recommendations to strengthen gender integration toward improving outcomes and sustainability of fisheries, gender equality, but also uh, women empowerment. AGEN is a 10-year program la launched by USAID in 2014 and is implemented by the International Union of Conservation of Nature. The program supports existing or emerging USAID environmental efforts by first, making the case for gender integration, second, filling critical information gaps, and third, providing technical support. Recognizing women as an agent of change, valuing diverse knowledge, experience, and capacities of women and men alike, and working to bridge gender gaps, agent ambitions a work that approach environmental work at all levels with gender responsive policy and action. Women play an important role in fisheries. However, in practice, their role is still often not recognized or supported. Women participation in fisheries management has been also high, highly uh, recognized in research and the academia. When we study the intersection between gender and wild, wild catch fisheries, generally what we found is that research focuses on how fisheries provide opportunities for realizing gender outcomes, thereby missing the opportunity to advance and how women can uniquely provide significant sustainable conservation contributions to the fisheries sector. This gap is significant as women's empowerment activities that do not specifically promote sustainability can inevitably drive overfishing. And it also misses the opportunity to explore and, and exploit the ways in which women empowered can, in a unique but effective way, contribute to sustainable fisheries management outcomes. Our guide. Genderism features as zero opportunities, therefore aims to fill this gap by showing not only the roles that women play in the sector, but also how women can benefit from features while contributing to their sustainable management. The guide also addresses how features present a challenge in, in mitigating and preventing uh, gender-based violence. The, the guide was developed through a extensive literature review that we did. We also review available information of projects implemented by USAID, but also by other international, uh, international organizations as FAO. We did an informal interviews and numerous peer reviews by practitioners. We also uh, gathered information from the gender and culture of the future event that happened last year in Thailand. Now, I would like, I, I will walk you to some of the key findings across uh, these uh, four sections that you are seeing now in the slides. So let's dive into the 
an overview of some of the key findings that we have. Women are estimated to make up 50% of the workforce in the fishery supply chain. However, when we think about harvesting, usually fishing is often associated with the men who typically harvest fish from a vessel offshore. But in practice, men's fishing activities are heavily supported by women who play the organization role not only processing and selling, but also financing and logistically supporting fisher expeditions. A closer look of the, sec of the sector, and I always uh, say that using our gender lens, we reveal us that women and men working in fisheries typically fill distinct but complementary roles. The FAO estimate that women comprise 50% of the workforce involved in harvesting and fill 90% of the jobs and fishing processing, which include activities such as canning and cutting. Traditionally, women are more involved in mutual harvesting methods, such as collective and gathering, and all these activities are known as a gleaning. As women uh, make up the majority of the fish processors, they are reliant on sustainable supply to fish to ensure their livelihoods are protector. In the fishery, in the industrial fish processing, women perform various tasks such as shocking scallops or, or shrimp, filleting and skinning fish or packing and canning uh, seafood products. However, men dominate high paid and more skilled and secure industrial processing jobs, such as filleting, skinning and deboning. Across small scale fisheries, women har harvest or buy fish from goods from landed sites and at times also obtain fish from their husband to process. At this small scale, women process fish by drying it, smoking, salting, and also prevent preserving fish as well as uh, shocking and preparing mollusks and invertebrates. At the micro and small scale, women are not only typically the first buyers of fish and processors, but also market their products for sale to brokers and buyers alike. For example, in Asia, women make 60% of the seafood, uh, market 60% of the seafood, while estimates, for example, in Western Africa, uh, they can be as higher as 80 percent. We can see now that in the context of marketing as, a, uh, as with processing, sustainable fisheries are incredibly important for women. And if these uh, fisheries are exhausted, uh, this will have a really hard impact in their livelihoods. Marketing is also a crucial entry point for economic empowerment uh, in, of women. For example, in Thailand, an, an OEM project helped ensure the vitality of fish stocks by helping women to focus on marketing tactics on increased wage instead of increasing the volume of sales. And changes in the marketing approach result in earning of 1,200,000 1, higher than the average day, uh, Thai daily income. The women play a numerous and varied roles through fishery value chains. They tend to be absent in corporate, government, and community leadership. In 2018, IUCN research found that in the world's national fishery ministries, only nine of the top positions, about 50%, were held by women. One of these women is the Indonesian Ministry of Marine Affairs and fisheries, who is globally recognized as a strong leader that works to fight a billion dollar pirate fishing and foreign feeds to protect Indonesian sovereignty, prosperity, and sustainability. You can find more of her story in our guide. In corporate world, recent studies show men holding 90% of the sea company direction chip. 53% of the cooperative sample groups are run exclusively by men, 
without a single woman director on the board or, or, or a board member. And in 2016, an analysis of 71 major seafood companies showed that there was one woman CEO. As a Thai union group, women hold 18% of the senior level management position and zero board positions. Nevertheless, Dr. Darian McBain, the Thai union group director of Corporate Affairs and Sustainability, showed that women leadership is valuable. She has shifted the company from a commodity focus toward a holistic system, ecosystem approach that focuses on oceans and people and, and the UN Sustainable Development Goal as a framework. Now, at the community level, women also face uh, barriers when it comes to assessing leadership and decision-making roles. For example, in a province of Solomon Islands, where the land and marine tenure is inherited to, to patrilineal and matrilineal uh, descent, 72% of the women interviewed for a study report that they were not included in the resource management decisions. However, at the community level, there's also good examples. Women are increasingly creating spaces for themselves through fishing organizations, through associations, to sustainably advocate for the rights, sharing the knowledge with, with other women, and designing, saving, and creating facilities. For example, in Thailand, the Women Network for the Defense of Fish Work Rights advances women's right to access, use, and management of the natural resources. So this is what I have to say. So I have gave the opportunity to the other presenters to continue. Thanks. Thank you so much, Jackie. And as we are transitioning slides here, I will just take the opportunity to remind everyone to feel very free to send your questions throughout the presentations using the chat function in the control panel. Now, our next speaker is Dr. Heidi Schutenberg. With over 20 years of experience designing, implementing, and adaptively managing projects that focus on marine conservation and natural resource management, her work focuses on strengthening the institutional arrangements for conservation, informed by key attributes of the social and ecological context in which programs are operating. Dr. Schutenberg has published over 50 books, reports, and papers, her co-authored book, A Reef Manager's Guide to Coral Bleaching, has been used to train over 400 reef managers across 60 countries. Heidi is an avid tennis player, and she's always looking for opportunities to see her favorite fish, the bumphead parrotfish. Heidi, the floor is yours. Thanks, Kate. So Jackie spoke to us about the importance of women in fisheries. Um, and I'm going to share our findings about the linkages we explored between gender equality and sustainable fisheries. And as the fishy person on the phone, um, I really can't miss an opportunity just to highlight the importance of fisheries as a development pathway. Uh, Wild-caught fisheries are significant for food security, livelihoods, and economic growth, and this is really one of the reasons we focused on this nexus of gender equality and sustainable fisheries management. Some people are surprised to learn that fish are one of the world's most widely traded food products, with an export value that's actually greater than rice, tea, sugar, and cocoa combined. Uh, 3.1 billion people get at least 20% of their animal protein from fish. NFAO estimates that wild-caught fish combined with aquaculture support the livelihoods of 12% of the world's population. And as Jackie mentioned, it's estimated that half of the workforce involved in fisheries are women. So this is sort of the broader fisheries context that this work is embedded in. As we really started looking at the nexus of gender equality in fisheries, one of the first things that we were pleased to see was that gender is recognized and emphasized in key global guidelines on fisheries management. So for example, FAO's voluntary guidelines on small scale fisheries really clearly articulates um, and 
prominently highlights the need to address quality, gender equality in its guidelines. But when Corinne and I started working with IUCN to think about gender in fisheries, we wanted to know a bit more. The question we really asked was, would you get better outcomes for both gender equality, women's empowerment, and sustainable fisheries if you worked in these sectors together? Uh, so IUCN has done a really wonderful review with this guide, but despite a very extensive search of the literature um, and lots of key informant interviews, they found that currently there's very little systematic evidence to answer this question one way or the other. Um, there was one exception, which I'll highlight. What we found was that a lot of the research in this space is focused on illuminating the roles women are playing in fisheries, which is really important. Um, but what we did find is a series of anecdotes that are shared in the guide, which we analyzed to reveal three main pathways by which we've hypothesized that integrated work uh, focused on both gender equality and sustainable fisheries management together would result in stronger outcomes for both sectors than if these sectors were programmed separately. So that's what I wanna share with you is these three pathways. The first one is the potential for women to be constituents and leaders in fisheries management. So why would this contribute to gender equality? The reason is that in many rural areas around the world, particularly, well, in coastal areas, women's lives and well-being are often directly affected by the supply of fish and therefore the quality of fisheries management in their area. So engaging them in fisheries management, both as constituents and as leaders, gives them greater agency in the resources that underpin their family's protein and income. As an example, I was part of a political economy analysis in Ghana recently, and we saw that not only do women process the fish, as Jackie was describing, but they also financed fishing trips, and that they were very much impacted by stress over sharp declines in the small-scale fisheries um, that are occurring in Ghana right now, that with this decreased catch, family stress um, around income increased and created tension in the family in, in a few cases resulting in um, potential increase in domestic violence. So we feel like this is a sector that for many women is really directly affects their quality of life. How does engaging women as constituents and leaders potentially improve fisheries management? Um, this is the place where we did find some good evidence. There was a systematic review by Lesher et al. in 2016, and he found that when you looked at both forestry and fishery areas, community areas, that management groups that were balanced in their gender composition were more effective in conflict resolution, there was more equitable resource sharing, and there was improved surveillance and enforcement. And this really fits within broader theories and evidence that we have about the importance of inclusive and participatory natural resource management. We also have examples that are shared in the guide where when women are left out of fishery management decisions, the rules that are put in place may not account for their use of the resources. So there are unfortunate examples of unintended consequences of women being further disempowered or their interests disenfranchised um, because they weren't involved and the way they were using the resource wasn't well understood. The second pathway we identified as women serving directly as resource stewards. So as Jackie mentioned, women do directly harvest resources, particularly uh, inshore resources. And in many cases, these nursery areas are mangrove areas or the types of habitats that are really important for the fin fish that men are catching offshore. So where women can be directly empowered to serve as resource stewards, it gives them direct control over the resources that underpin their livelihoods, and it can also improve fisheries management both for the resources they're harvesting and for uh, other fish offshore that depend on those inshore resources. And I just want to give you one of my favorite examples here, which is um, in Gambia. It's called the TRY, Women's Oyster Association. And this was a USAID-funded project which won the UNDP Ecuador, or sorry, Equator Prize. 
And what happened was they managed to, for the first time, clearly designate resource management rights to a group of about 500 women. These were middle-aged women, many of them widowed without um, a lot of education and a lot of other opportunities. But by working with them where they had clear resource tenure, uh, they were able to implement a co-management plan and put in place a closed season where they only harvested oysters certain times of year. And the oysters grew much bigger with the benefit of this closed season. And that combined with um, improved processing techniques and improved uh, skills and access to finance really improved the livelihoods, both of these women, um, but also of these oyster fisheries. And in the process, these women replanted 34 hectares of mangrove area, which was of great benefit uh, to the ecosystems overall. And finally, the last pathway we identified is the role that women play in seafood supply chains. And as Jackie mentioned, this is one of the areas with which women are most associated. So a lot of work has focused on um, engaging women in this part of the value chain. So how does this improve gender equality and sustainable fisheries management? I think this is one of the places it's easiest to see that interlinkage because you really get a very nice win-win. And to explain the opportunity, I wanna share something that I heard the Minister of Fisheries for the Seychelles um, talk about at a World Bank meeting recently. The Seychelles is a very ocean-oriented economy and he noted that, he said the ocean is our economy and the future, um, but it's not going to sustain us by catching more fish. There aren't more fish to catch. It's going to happen by increasing the value we get while maintaining or reducing our catch. And so women are crucial to this idea of how do we really increase the value that we're getting for fish instead of trying to um, drive economies by catching more fish, which can lead to overfishing and in many cases has. So directly improving the value of fishery products that women sell um, improves their sense of agency, their decision-making, and their access to resources. And when combining that with good fisheries management, this market-driven approach can be a key leverage point for reforming fisheries. Um, for example, when women have the right training and tools, they can be discerning in which fish they purchase, uh, being sure to favor legally caught fish and fish that are larger and will be more valuable. And similarly, when women aren't involved in fisheries management, they can themselves drive demand for fish that isn't sustainable and drives overfishing. So they have very clear equities um, through their role in the market. And it's a place that we increasingly see a lot of opportunity to engage women in empowerment activities to the benefit of sustainable fisheries management. So with that, I would like to pass it to my colleague, Corinne. Hey everybody, excuse me, it's minor technical difficulty there. Thank you so much, Heidi, that was fantastic. And there are already questions rolling in for you, so stay tuned. Our third speaker is Corinne Hart, the Senior Advisor for Gender and Environment in the Office of Gender Equality and Women's Empowerment, GenDev, at USAID. Corinne provides technical leadership and assistance on gender equality and women's empowerment in a range of environmental sectors, including the agency's work on energy, infrastructure, biodiversity, forestry, fisheries, land tenure, urbanization, and climate change. She's also leading several agency initiatives, including Engendering Utilities, the Learning Initiative on Women's Empowerment, Finance, and Fisheries, and Agent, Advancing Gender in the Environment. So Corinne, the floor is yours. Hi, thanks all. Um, thanks, Kate, for that introduction. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, 
<clears throat> some of the uh, other issues that come up in fishery that are of a concern from a gender perspective. Um, uh, first, talking about gender-based violence and fishing communities um, and how uh, some of the research that we uh, reviewed really demonstrated that this is a specific concern when thinking about gender equality in fisheries. For example, um, we saw that through some of the research that rates can be four to 14 times higher than national averages um, for HIV infection in fishing communities. And this, is, um, uh, this can be for a couple of different reasons. GBV, um, uh, gender-based violence in particular, can persist due to social and structural inequalities that, that exist in fishing communities. And this can create vulnerable conditions so for example, women can lack an access to fisheries resources. There can be shifting social and power dynamics um, regarding different roles, gender differentiated roles in fisheries. And of course, there is this increased risk of HIV AIDS in fishing communities, um, which uh, is particularly um, uh, an issue for women. Mm. Uh, the lack of access to fisheries resources, for example, uh, the reason that that can uh, be a driver of gender-based violence is that sex can be coerced in exchange for access to those fisheries resources. And as Heidi mentioned, women um, in coastal communities can be incredibly reliant on fisheries resources in order um, for their livelihoods and um, overall health. And so uh, in order to be able to access those resources, um, in a fair and equitable way, uh, it's something that's a, a, of a great concern when you're thinking about a gender perspective with fisheries work. Um, another, um, another key issue in fisheries that can really exacerbate GBV is um, that there are characteristics within these communities that can include negative peer pressure among men um, associated with strong group identity and social isolation or marginalization, which can result from the stark gender divisions of labor when you see men, for example, being away for very long periods of time during fishing trips and visiting communities as, they, um, as they're fishing that are, that are not their home communities. Um, we've also seen that some programs um, have uh, been focusing on ways to address, the, to address ways that men perceive their roles and place in society to offer positive ideas about masculinity. So there were a few examples where we saw that projects were trying to directly address gender-based violence. Um, and as I said, HIV rates can be higher in fishing communities, um, and it's often higher among women than men. And this is, again, in part due to women's diminished bargaining power, their lack of income, food insecurity, and other considerations that can lead to risky practices such as um, being coerced uh, for sex for fish. One of the things that we really wanted to do in this guide, a sea of opportunities, was to not just um, share the research and the findings from this global review, but really make recommendations to practitioners who are trying to address gender equality and women's empowerment issues um, in their programming. From pulling out the examples of what we've seen work in the research and the literature that we reviewed and really putting in a concrete recommendation section. So what you'll see in the guide is that we've recommended um, uh, concrete interventions that can increase gender equality and women's empowerment in the fishery sector. Um, but really first, we recommend that all practitioners and um, people designing these projects with a sustainable fisheries management lens really do three um, sort of analytical steps in action planning before they decide on their intervention. So for example, we have highlighted that we recommend that you conduct a gender analysis, create a gender action plan, and you develop a results chain. Um, and this is really important when thinking strategically about the interventions that you're going to select to make sure that they are actually tied to the situation and the context with which you're working. Um, and the results chain helps you ensure that the steps that you're taking have a logical and rational flow to ensuring the biodiversity impact that you're trying to have. Um, also in the document, we have sample interventions with accompanying resources and recommendations so that project designers um, can use 
these various uh, can use these tools with various types of stakeholders to help them understand why the project is selecting certain interventions and is prioritizing and funding certain interventions that are going to promote gender equality and women's empowerment, ideally with the end goal of also strengthening the sustainable fisheries management outcomes. So in the guide, you'll find a, a table of strategic interventions that have the intervention, the description, as well as resources and tools that are linked to the different types of interventions so that pra practitioners can learn how to design and implement these types of interventions effectively. Um, uh, so for example, um, some of the strategic interventions that you could consider if you are, um, if you are thinking about looking at how to explicitly uh, address gender equality and women's empowerment in your fisheries program are here on the slide. So for example, strengthening women's voices through organizations. What we saw time and time again in the research and the project examples that we reviewed is that women's organizations have the potential to benefit women in fisheries by enabling them to work collectively to promote access to the resources, finance, technology, and equipment. So helping women to organize can strengthen their ability to demand this type of equitable access um, as well as amplify their voices in advocating for sustainable fisheries management and improving their own working conditions. These types of associations, these women's groups, are also often effective in improving women's business and negotiating skills and increasing confidence and leadership. So, for example, in a project that we saw in Tunisia showed that women clam collectors with low bargaining power were able to improve their conditions and earn 22% more income when they work together by forming an association. So really thinking carefully about whether or not organizing women into a collective group is a critical way for those women to amplify their voices and be part of the sustainable fisheries management solution is something that we would encourage practitioners to think about. Also, of course, you, we believe that you should be strengthening women's leadership and providing opportunities for women to participate in leadership roles, particularly as you want them to become powerful constituents in sustainable fisheries management. Resource tenure is obviously a critical component to ensuring that women um, have equitable access to the fisheries resources that are available in the community. Um, and then also it helps women have uh, it helps women play the role of being able to promote sustainable fisheries management when they actually have control over the resources themselves. Increasing financial tools and access to finance is something that came up time and time again, where specific financial tools are needed to meet women's fish, uh, women fisher folks' diverse and di differentiated needs in the fishery sector um, because women need access to finance to promote a more sustainable value chain. So for example, some of the projects that we reviewed show that women who received, who received credit to support their fishery-related enterprise reported their increased income, which they used to purchase household appliances, pay school fees, and reinvest in their businesses. Um, of course, we also found that one of the key strategic interventions um, uh, for women's empowerment in particular was helping women to understand how to add value to their fish products. So interventions that improve the efficiency of activities associated with fish products between the time the fish are harvested and the time the final product is delivered to the customer can result in economic safety and health benefits. For example, we, we saw and reviewed a project in Cote d'Ivoire where a new oven system that doubled as a, as a dryer and storage unit reduced losses and delivered safer and better quality fish with both higher rates of return and improved health outcomes for women. Um, and then also improving marketing and sales skills. Interventions to improve women's livelihoods through better marketing of fisheries products should be designed to address the barriers that women face in entering markets and the tools and skills they need to be successful while also ensuring the vitality of fish stocks. Um, and so I just wanted to point to an example um, that we've really highlighted as a success story. Um, and this is a project that USAID has been supporting called Sustainable Fisheries, Man the Sustainable Fisheries Management Project, SSMP in Ghana. 
In coastal Ghana, women in fishing communities are dominant in fish processing and trading, whereas men are participating in the extractive processes. But women's income contributes to the fisheries value chain in really critical ways. So for example, women use their own income to invest in canoes, gears, and they finance fishing trips and even disperse loans to men. The goal of this USAID-supported project is to rebuild marine fishery stocks through responsible fishing practices, improved co-management, and strengthened information systems. Because the project um, implementers recognized that women had such a critical role to play, they did a gender analysis and created a gender action plan, um, as well as conducted their results chain in order to identify specific gender objectives, which would help them include women as part of the powerful constituency that would help them improve the fisheries practices and co-management of the resources. Some of the things they identified as key interventions was to increase women's ability to be entrepreneurs in, in, in improved fish processing, increasing uh, the women's involvement as co-managers of fisheries resources, and figuring out ways to increase access to finance. When they uh, did the different work to achieve those goals, so for example, they did trainings on business development and sustainable fisheries management for women processors. What they found was pretty exciting. They found that women were able to produce higher value products through improved processing techniques. And they found that women who were participating were more confident, knowledgeable, and empowered to speak out on management issues and to really become powerful advocates for the sustainable fisheries management practices that the project was trying to promote. Um, so you'll see here some of the results where they trained nearly 3,500 women, um, not only on business services, but also on hygienic, hygienic fish handling, which helped increase their business and helped increase their income. And we actually saw in this project also that there were new policies that were created, like, for example, the fisheries ministry actually adopted a gender mainstreaming anti-child trafficking strategy, which really helped um, identify uh, specific ways the government could engage to promote gender equality and women's empowerment in, in the community. Um, I want to transition just quickly and, and end the presentation um, by really uh, just giving you a snapshot of the next steps that we're taking after these, um, uh, after we've released this report. So as, as Heidi mentioned, uh, we were, we were really hoping that this global review would be able to pull out really concrete data that showed that women's empowerment and gender equality interventions had concrete sustainable fisheries management outcomes. But what we found through this global review was that there, while there were, um, of course, as Heidi mentioned, direct, um, uh, there was some research that directly showed that women's empowerment and gender equality is a strong entry point uh, fisheries are a strong entry point for achieving those outcomes, we were not uh, um, as successful as fi at finding the reverse, where sustainable fisheries management outcomes were directly impacted by gender equality and women's empowerment outcomes. We also found that access to finance was a thread that was consistent throughout all of the projects where women's empowerment and gender equality issues were coming up. So we've launched, um, USAID has launched this learning initiative uh, the Learning Initiative on Women's Empowerment, Access to Finance, and Sustainable Fisheries. And we are going to be piloting approaches in several USAID-funded sites where we will be incorporating access to financial services and women's economic empowerment interventions into fisheries programs. We're doing this in Ghana, Indonesia, the Philippines, um, and we're looking at doing retrospective lookbacks in two project sites in Malawi and Bangladesh. And the idea is to provide some pilots, some funding to do pilot um, interventions where we can investigate how fisheries, uh, or, I'm sorry, where we can investigate under which conditions women's empowerment interventions would actually improve fisheries management outcomes. And we're looking at different types of interventions, like where Heidi had mentioned the different pathways, women as stewards, women as constituents and leaders, women as um, through their role in the market. And likewise, we'll be collecting data as well on how fisheries are a key entry point for women's economic empowerment, hopefully to build the evidence base in that area as well. Um, and this aligns with several different USAID um, 
priority policies and initiatives, including the newly launched Women's Global Development and Prosperity Initiative, which is, fo is, is focusing USAID and prioritizing USAID's work on women's economic empowerment. It also helps promote um, and helps USAID meet its mandates around the gender equality and female empowerment policy, as well as our agency-wide biodiversity policy. So we hope to be collecting this evidence over the next year and then sharing it widely. And as we um, collect this evidence, we will hopefully be able to open the learning initiative up to other partners and other projects that want to be able to do similar types of data collection and research to help build the evidence base and really demonstrate through rigorous research that women's empowerment and gender equality is not just a nice thing to do. It's something that's actually critical for achieving biodiversity outcomes and making sure that sustainable fisheries management outcomes that are targets of these projects are met because we truly believe that if you leave half of the community behind, you won't be as successful. Thank you. Back to you, Kate. Thank you so much, Corinne. Fantastic. Okay, so that brings us to the conclusion of our three presentations. We have about 10 minutes left and we have some really interesting questions coming in. So thank you all very much for your active engagement. Um, I have a couple of questions here geared towards Heidi. So I'm gonna ask you, Heidi, to unmute yourself and get ready to, to chime in. And, and actually, Jackie and Corinne, please feel free to unmute yourselves as well. And we can we can have slightly informal last 10 minutes here where we chime in and and um, and field these questions together. So Heidi, two questions for you. Um, uh, uh, somebody has asked, the cases that do exist demonstrating the linkages between gender equality and better sustainable sustainability outcomes, why do you think there are actually so few cases? And what are the obstacles to addressing this knowledge gap? That's the first question around what are our obstacles to, to filling this knowledge gap, even maybe better understanding this knowledge gap. And then the second question for you, Heidi, is can you elaborate a bit more on why fisheries management implementation or enforcement was actually more effective and created increased benefits overall when women were or are involved to a higher degree? Yeah, thanks for those great questions. So on the first one about knowledge gap, I can only speculate. I think there's a few things. I think first, um, it, it has just been an important first step for the research to do what it's been doing, which is to really surface that women are not invisible in fisheries, although people tend to think of fisheries and think of men on fishing boats, as Jackie mentioned, um, that women are very dominant in the sector, uh, you know, likely 50% of the folks involved. So I think that was just sort of an important first focus. I also think we did find a range of anecdotes, but it's an issue that you see in, I think, a number of areas of scientific endeavor where the extent to which people are measuring systematically to understand this question of, do you get stronger fisheries management outcomes when women are more involved, and is fisheries a good entry point for women's economic empowerment? I'm just not sure those have been the research questions that have been posed and answered in a methodical way. So I think where we are in this trajectory is having a good um, set of examples that gives us a strong theoretical basis for now doing some better management which as Corinne mentioned, we're starting to do in USAID through our learning initiative, and we're happy to share more information about that, sort of the theory of change that we're using and what we're measuring and how, if others are interested in, in this type of work, please reach out to us. In terms of the question of why is it that you would get better fishery management outcomes if women are involved, I think there's a, a number of, um, answers to that. If you look at the systematic review by Lesher, uh, that really found that women work in ways that are complementary to men. They bring different approaches to conflict resolution, different approaches towards the importance of an equitable sharing of resources. And so they really noted that uh, the way women solve problems is a, an asset and a benefit when they're brought into fishery management or forestry management discussions. 
I think at even a more basic level, as Corinne mentioned, there's a, a math element here that if you're missing out on 50% of the people who are impacted by fishery management decisions, um, you're not going to have an accurate reflection of the demand for good sustainable fisheries management, and you're not going to have the support of the constituency that you need to understand and be behind changes in resource use. So I think as it's become clear that women do play a very dominant role in fisheries, both in supporting men's fishing trips financially and logistically, and in processing fish as soon as it arrives on shore, as well as harvesting some resources directly themselves, it just becomes increasingly clear that these management efforts really can't be effective if they're not engaging their key constituencies, which we now know includes women. Great, Heidi. Thank you so much. Um, Corinne, I'm coming to you for the next question, an interesting one about funding. So someone writes, as a sustainable fisheries nonprofit, can we use the guide also to provide res or to, to find resources for where to look for support or funding that would help us with gender integration into our projects? We know where to look for sustainable fisheries funding, but where do we go for gender equality foundations or grants? Etc. Any words of wisdom there? Uh, well, that's an excellent question. I think um, maybe Kate and Jackie, also from your perspective at the Global Gender Office, you'd be able to weigh in on that. I'm not sure from the guide you'll be able to directly find um, links to donors who are interested in this issue, but I do think you'll see a range of partners that are discussed throughout the guide from the uh, different case studies that are pulled out as well as in the recommendations and resources section you'll see which organizations have created those resources and tools which are um, pretty inter they're tools that interlink these two issues and you can usually see who has funded and supported those tools and resources as well as which projects have been able to receive funding where the donor allowed the project to explicitly spend funding on gender equality intervention. So I think that's one place to start. Um, I think also, as you're seeing here, USAID is clearly interested in this intersection. And many donors like USAID have a mandate to integrate gender and address gender equality and women's empowerment throughout all of its activities. And so really understanding what are the mandates that drive different donors that are funding this type of work um, and how to tap into those requirements is one strategy that you can use. Um, but I think also one of the goals of this learning initiative that Heidi and I have is, is really to position USAID as a thought leader in this space and to influence other donors around the importance of allowing practitioners to use funding to be able to do standalone gender activities or to integrate gender and empowerment activities into their projects. And that is going to be a process to make that case, which is why we're collecting this evidence, and to really convince a wide range of donors, not just USAID, that this is something that is a worthwhile investment of their funding if they really want to achieve sustainable fisheries management outcomes. So that's something that we're committed to do um, on the donor perspective, but I do think a, a, quick, a quick start might be reviewing the organizations that are featured in the guide and looking at who's funding them and really allowing for this flexibility to fund gender equality and women's empowerment interventions as part of a key strategy for their sustainable fisheries management program. Thank you, Corinne. Um, speaking of evidence, really interesting question. How do we ensure the accuracy of disaggregated statistics in this sector? Anybody want to chime in on that? And then a follow-up question, do any of the speakers have resources for project implementers to help them conduct gender analyses and create gender action plans? Jackie, maybe you want to start? Hi, hi, Kate. Um, I would like to come in a little bit on some of the questions. Uh, in relation to the first one about the cap of information, I think one thing that will help us to gather more information is that actually the projects develop indicators that link 
the uh, women empowerment and sustainable and better sustainable uh, management of fisheries. So that will make the projects to start gathering information about this link and that will help us, you know, to start building the evidence. And in relation with the, uh, the uh, donors, I think the document that we have developed provide really good information that can help us to approach to a donor to really show the importance of having women and men fully uh, participating in, in, in uh, fisheries management, but also showing the evidence of the gap that we are having and, and, and how it will be important for them to provide funds so we can develop projects. Thank you, Jackie. Great. Okay, we're right at the hour, everybody. So I, I see there are still quite a number of participants on the line. So I'm going to go around and ask the speakers for their one key takeaway in 30 seconds or less. If there's one thing you want people to walk away from this webinar, knowing, following up on, engaging in action, what would it be? And let's go in reverse order. Corinne, can I ask you to start? Sure, yes. I think um, this kind of speaks to the answer that Heidi just gave. Um, and I think it's a key takeaway for all of us who've been engaged in this project, that when we recently attended the Gender and Aquacultures and Fisheries Conference, which is sort of the global convening of practitioners and researchers thinking about gender and fisheries, uh, we found that there was so much robust research being presented on the role of women in fisheries. Um, and, and really helping to reduce the invisibility that women face in the fishery sector, where, whereby people do not necessarily recognize that they play a critical role. That we were, we were surprised that, that there was not more research um, coming out looking at the direct connection between gender equality interventions and sustainable fisheries management outcomes. And I think it was a real eye-opener to see that you know, while it may be obvious to some of us, especially as gender specialists and experts thinking about these issues, this can be an obvious connection, that there is a lot of work to be done to build this evidence base, and that there's still work to be done even to convince um, practitioners, donors, implementers, and researchers that women have a critical role to play in fisheries, that they are there in the communities, and while they may not always be out on boats, they are doing many other things that are critical to the survival of the fisheries and for these livelihoods and these households. Um, and so really just being at that conference, being amongst basically the world's leading experts on gender and fisheries, and really seeing how the case still needed to be made um, to document the role of women was eye-opening and I think really helped propel us to think that the learning initiative and the Sea of Opportunities guide in itself we're filling really critical gaps and that USA does have a, a critical role to play as a donor and a thought leader in this space. Thank you, Corinne. Heidi? Yes, well, June 8th is World Oceans Day and the theme this year is gender in oceans. So my takeaway is just that this is really a, an interesting and critical time to be focused on this issue. So for those coming from a women's empowerment and a gender equity perspective, I would invite you to consider the world of fisheries management as also an interesting entry point for that work, complementing maybe more traditional avenues like health and education. And for my colleagues who work in fisheries, um, you know, while we've made the case that there isn't a systematic uh, evidence base at this time, I think what we have established is a strong theoretical basis for really seeing that we're likely to get much better fishery management outcomes by engaging women. So I really look forward to um, engaging with a lot of my colleagues in thinking about how to do that better. Thank you so much, Heidi. June 8th, World Oceans Day on the calendar. Jackie. Thanks, Kate. Yes, women are agents of change. They have an important role to play in sustainable fishing and management. What we need to do is to create enabling conditions and an environment and strengthen their leadership to allow them to fully and actively participate and we will see how things change in sustainable fishing and management. Thanks. 
Thank you. Thank you each, Jackie, Heidi, Corinne, for your brilliant presentations and your expertise. Thank you to all the participants for your attention, for your interest, for spending this time with us. A very special thank you again to our partners at USAID. This is an incredible area of work that we're thrilled to partner with you on. A last reminder to everyone that this webinar is being recorded. You will get it in your emails uh, in just a couple of days, along with a package of all the presentations. Uh, you're welcome to reach out to us at any time for with further questions, for more information, to explore collaboration. Um, we look forward to hearing from you. We have another webinar coming up in this agent webinar series that will address gender and urban services. And that will be scheduled in the next couple of weeks. It will likely take place at the end of July. So if you're interested in that, stay tuned, reach out to us for further details, and we look forward to staying in touch with all of you. Thanks a lot. And with that, we close and wish you a wonderful day.